Hearing will come to order. And uh, let me begin by thanking um, Ambassador Jacobs and all of our distinguished witnesses and guests for being here today, especially uh, the left behind parents that I see in the audience for joining us this afternoon to continue and to increase attention on international parental child abduction, whose victims include primarily children denied the love and attention of one of their parents, and parents cut off from their children that they love. Every year, by some estimates, approximately 1,000 American children are unlawfully removed from their homes by one of their parents and taken across international borders. Less than half of these children ever come home. Most of the left behind parents in the audience today have not seen their children in years and know all too well the financial, legal, cultural, and linguistic obstacles to bringing their children home from a foreign country. Many of you have already been through a U.S. judicial proceeding prior to the abduction, and the courts have settled custody and available or have failed. In 1983, the United States ratified the Hague Convention on the Civil Aspects of International Child Abduction to try to address abduction and access. This convention created a, a civil framework for a quick return of abducted children and for rights of access for left behind parents. Absent extenuating circumstances, the child or children are to be returned within six weeks to his or her country of habitual residence for the courts there to decide on custody or to enforce any previous custody determinations. The convention has helped return some children, but implementation has been unpredictable and spotty at best. Susceptible to abuse by taking parents or judges who either don't understand their obligations under the convention or are unwilling to abide by them, the convention has too often been stretched to provide cover for the abduction rather than the recovery of the child. Some Hague Convention parties are simply not enforcing legitimate return orders. The State Department's 2014 Hague Convention Compliance Report highlights four countries, Brazil, Mexico, Romania, and Ukraine, that habitually fail to enforce return orders. Other countries, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Honduras, and the Bahamas, are non-compliant with the convention. In other words, abducted American children are not coming home from these countries and so many other countries where the convention operates weekly or with which the United States has no bilateral agreement of any kind. To give one more example, Jeffrey Morehouse, who a left behind parent who will testify today, uh, will say that there, are, there have been 400 cases of U.S. children kidnapped to Japan since 1994. We do not know of a single case in which the government of Japan has issued and enforced an order for the return of an abducted child to the United States. That is unconscionable. And I must emphasize that since they have signed the Hague, Japan's efforts have been breathtakingly unresponsive, especially for abductions that occurred prior to their ratification of the Hague Convention. Mr. Morehouse will testify that one year ago next week, at the very moment Japan acceded to the Hague Abduction Convention, parents joined us to hand deliver 30 Article 21 access applications. I would note parenthetically, I joined those parents at the Japanese Embassy. They were unbelievably respectful and disciplined and very, very cordial and yet very, very determined. None of the back home parents, however, have received access to their kidnapped children. That's, that's almost a year ago next week. Japan's implementation of the Hague Abduction Convention, Mr. Morehouse will go on to say, is an abysmal failure. Sanctions under the Goldman Act will provide some of the necessary public pressures on Japan to create change to this ongoing human and family rights crisis. Again, the status quo is simply not acceptable. Over the last five years, many of you who are here today helped me and my staff write and pass through the Congress the Sean and David Goldman Child Abduction Prevention and Return Act, 
simply known as the Goldman Act. Today's hearing occurs more than seven months after the Goldman Act became law and gives us an, an opportunity to hear from the State Department and parents whether the bill's key provisions are being implemented according to the law. A brief refresher on Sean and David. David Goldman spent over five agonizing years trying to legally rescue his son, Sean, from abduction to Brazil, which is a signatory nation like the U.S. to the Hague Abduction Convention. Despite Mr. Goldman's airtight case that demonstrated an egregious example of both child abduction and wrongful retention, the Hague Treaty was unavailing, and the outcomes in the Brazilian courts proved large, mostly infuriating and firm and ineffective. David Goldman weighs his case by the book and what judgments in New Jersey courts, yet both Sean and David were made to suffer emotional pain for over half a decade as one delaying ploy after another was employed by the abducting party. In the end, because of, the, of a father's abiding love for his son and an indomitable will, like so many of you here today who have suffered so much, the Goldmans today are united and happy, unlike you who still are separated. To underscore, the Goldman Act was not intended to simply reform the system, but to bring about a fundamental sea change in U.S. diplomacy so that the State Department officials would see themselves as advocates for the return of abducted American children. Now under the Goldman Act, when a country fails to appropriately address an abduction case pending for more than 12 months, the law requires the Secretary of State to take action. When a country has more than 30 percent of its U.S. cases pending for more than a year, the law requires the Secretary of State to designate the country a non-compliant as non-compliant in the annual report and take action. The Goldman Act specifically lists the increasingly escalating actions that Congress has in mind, from a demarche or protest through diplomatic channels, to a public condemnation, to a delay or cancellation of one or more bilateral visits, and even the withdrawal, limitation, or suspension of foreign assistance, including non-humanitarian aid and including security assistance to the central government of authority of a, of a country. These are serious sanctions that must be seriously applied by a country that takes parental child abduction seriously. We may also request extradition where appropriate. If these measures sound pointed, it is because they are intended to focus the designation country on quick and accurate resolution of abduction and access cases. And we hope to find out today from Ambassador Jacobs how these tools are being used and with what frequency. The Goldman Act was written to cover countries that have signed the Hague Convention, such as Brazil, and countries that have not signed the Convention, such as India and countries that have a mix of open abduction cases from before and after signing the Hague Convention, such as Japan. In 2013, India was a, the number three destination in the world for parents who, ab, who were abducted from the United States. Currently, there are 64 known open abduction and denial of access cases involving India. And yet, the United States does not have any sort of resolution mechanism, to my knowledge, in India or with India. Moms and dads are left in the United States are forced to enter a foreign court system known for its incessant appeals and multi-year delays and even mega intimidation. But now the Goldman Act applies. India will now face real penalties for any case that has been pending for more than one year and will be named and shamed in the State Department's report. As with the State Department's annual trafficking report, there is morally suasive value in simply reporting what a country does and some countries will, I am sure, respond to such moral pressure. Thus, we expect the State Department to apply these penalties zealously and to work with India on establishing a bilateral agreement for the efficient and fair resolution of abduction and access cases. If the State Department faithfully applies the laws written, it will be in India's best interest to come to the negotiating table. The same holds true for Japan. Even though Japan recently signed the Hague Convention, in the upcoming April report, Congress expects that Japan will be evaluated not just on a tailing of new abduction cases after it joined The Hague last year, but on its work to resolve all open abduction cases, including the 67 cases that I and others have been raising with State for the last five years. Among such cases is that of Michael Elias, who has not seen his children, Jade and Michael, since 2008. Michael served as a Marine who saw combat in Iraq. His wife, who worked in the Japanese consulate, used documents fraudulently obtained with the apparent complicity of the Japanese consulate personnel to kidnap their children, then aged four and two, in defiance of a court order, telling Michael on the phone, 
uh, called, that there was nothing that he could do. She said, quote, my country, that is Japan, will protect me. Her country will protect her, but what is our country doing to protect Michael and his children? While the State Department has touted Japan's accession to the Hague Convention as an accomplishment, Japan has said the convention would only apply in post-ratification cases. As Ambassador Jacobs knows, I and several others predicted that unless an MOU or other bilateral agreement was concluded with Japan, American children and their left-behind parents will be left behind in perpetuity. I asked my friends at the State Department once again, what then is to happen for the parents already suffering from abductions prior to ratification? Would they be left behind again, this time by their own government? I know Ambassador Jacobs, who was here to testify as recently as February 2014, in her testimony before the Senate, stated that she would continue to make progress with the Japanese government on resolving existing cases in the spirit of the convention. We will have a chance to ask the Ambassador what progress has been made on resolving cases like Michael Elias, Captain Paul Toland, and so many others who are suffering every single day. And I'm sure when they wake up in the morning, it's the first thing they think of. The Goldman Act requires accountability for the Japanese government on the adoption cases open at the time signed when Japan signed the convention. Unless Japan resolves scores of American cases for the end of next month, nearly 100 percent of abduction cases in Japan will still be unresolved, and the Goldman Act penalties will apply. The Goldman Act has given the State Department new and very powerful tools to bring Japan and other countries to the, not the negotiating table, the resolution table. The goal is not to disrupt relations, but to heal the painful rifts caused by international child abduction. I look forward to hearing testimony on the Department's use of the tools, uh, and I would now like to yield uh, to, uh, to, to uh, Dr. Burra, uh, serving as Acting Ranking Member uh, for his opening comments. Right. Thank you, Chairman.